convoy at sea, one of the lifelines upon which the United Nations war effort relied. Obviously, the world's battlefronts must be kept constantly supplied with food and materials of all kinds. Supplies shipped across the Atlantic to Britain were vital to the defeat of Nazi Germany. The story of the North Atlantic convoys and the heroic sailors who defied German U-boats, storms and freezing weather has become part of British national identity. It's a story that's often been told. Less well known is that more than one in seven of the merchant seamen who risked their lives crewing the convoys were Chinese, and that when the war ended, their loyal service was rewarded with betrayal. When we got to the end of the war and the English men were coming back and wanted the jobs back, they had a secret home office meeting where it was discussed in Whitehall what to do about the Chinese merchant seamen and they decided they would round them up and forcibly repatriate them. That particular night, they went round all the sorts of chip chops, the dry cleaners, and the mahjong place where they used to play mahjong, the games places, picked them all up, put them into vans, drove them down to the docks, took them out into the Mersey, put them into boats. This is the story of a 70-year shame which the British government has only now acknowledged but still not apologised for, a story of lives blighted by lies and loss. I think it's what happened to our parents, the children that were left behind, that is the biggest travesty. You know, they are British children that the British government knew full well existed. They knew they deported the dads and left the mums without means to pay the bills. And yet that didn't bother them any more than it did to deport the men. There's a good chance you have close family in Singapore, isn't there? Your there dad is. probably, moved, maybe, hopefully, had a, had a new life and a new start in another country. Oh, well, yes. I hope he did. So you, you may have half-sisters or half-brothers. Yes, I'd like to know. There's now an increasingly urgent search for answers by ageing sons and daughters. You spent 20 years of your life trying to get to the bottom of the story. What is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? For the children who were left behind to know about their fathers, who disappeared. If you could meet him now, what would you say to him? Well, I'd give him a big hug first. And say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. And we couldn't do anything about it. But we can now. We want the truth. Own up to what they did. And let us step, settle. We're not got that many years left in us. But we just want the truth. Liverpool in northwest England is still one of Britain's biggest and busiest ports. During the Second World War, it was the base for those extraordinarily dangerous North Atlantic convoys in which thousands of sailors lost their lives. It was also the home base for Chinese seamen who crewed them. They sailed down this passage. The British government recruited thousands to help the war effort and was clear about their courage and the importance of their contribution. Thousands of Chinese seamen now serving with the Allied Merchant Navy, bringing food to Britain, munitions from America, cargoes from Africa and the East, and getting the convoys through to Russia, India, Australia. The British government produced this film in 1944 to promote their role. But in the West, her men fight on the merchant navy front, shoulder to shoulder in the greatest battle of naval history alongside their British seamen comrades. They too brave the torpedoes and the bombs and the mines, making history under fire. But as soon as the war was over, all the camaraderie was forgotten. British authorities showed a different face. The Chinese sailors were no longer welcome. 
even though many had children with British women and many were married. In the absence of an established legal right to remain, even those emotional and family ties counted for little, as thousands were rapidly expelled in a wholesale clear-out. Before 43? No. Well, I don't know, it's his second deportation. Oh, we deported to Shanghai on that one, wasn't we? Yeah. Brian Flower was a victim of that sudden switch in policy. He was just a baby when his father, Zai Fa Chow, disappeared. His mother became destitute and he ended up in an orphanage separated from his three siblings. Brian's now in his late 70s. It's his daughter, Kellyanne, Zai Fa Chow's granddaughter, who's trying to find answers. So what, what do we know about Grandad? Not a lot, really. I mean, we've got a name. We know he worked for Blue Funnel and he was a merchant seaman. We know he was deported and that it was done secretly. So the first time nobody really understood what had happened, just a lot of the community had vanished. The decision to throw out the sailors is well documented in Britain's National Archives. The name civil servants gave this original fire leaves no doubt how they viewed the people who just months previously they called heroes. It's called compulsory repatriation of undesirable Chinese seamen. The officials call them surplus to requirements and talk repeatedly of bulk clearances and the hundreds of wives and girlfriends they would be separated from. Well, one civil servant wrote that many were of the prostitute class. It seems extraordinary that these men who put their lives in danger for Britain were then deported. Why were they deported? It just looks like a racist decision. There's no other real conclusion to be had. They were called undesirables. They referred to them as, you know, criminal class, and they made some pretty nasty remarks about the wives. One of the papers says they were prostitute class. So they were just classed as nothing, really. And when the end of the war came and they felt they'd served their purpose, they didn't even feel a need to be nice to them or thankful to them for the job they've done. They just rounded them all up and deported them. Liverpool is home to Europe's oldest Chinatown, which developed in the 19th century thanks to the Chinese sailors who crewed ships trading with China and Asia. This pub in the heart of Chinatown is where they used to gather, to socialise, but also to get intelligence about the ships that might hire them. The Blue Funnel Line, which employed most of them, had an office next door. From its prestigious headquarters near the docks, it dominated Britain's shipping to and from Chinese and Asian ports. So, white gloves time. These Absolutely. are so precious, we have to... Gloves up. ..put these on. As yours. And the reason is, all of the oil everybody has on their hands and the chance yeah, of... Yeah, the, the residual oil can sort of pass on and that can ruin the prints. The Chinese sailors' lives during the war years were beautifully documented in a series of photographs by Bert Hardy, one of Britain's best-known news photographers at the time. So he was going into the boarding houses, places where people had to basically wait for the next ship to turn up. Um, so he was interested in the living conditions of people who were calling a city a home. What's extraordinary about this is that, you know, you, you, you see all of these Chinese names on, on ships' lists, and in many cases, um, not even names, but they're referred to almost as cargo. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, you see these men's faces. And it completely shifts the yeah. portrayal of these people, you know? Yeah. A lot of these people will have been living on ships. This might not have been sort of a, a strange living situation for them. You know, you can see that these people are at rest. Um, you can see here sort of smoking a pipe and may, maybe making some tea. 
Um, we've got sort of like reading materials, you know, they're interested in local news. They're very much sort of like forming a community here in Liverpool. There's something very moving about going through all of these pictures of these people and knowing now their faces, but not knowing their names. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know their names, do we? No, no, we don't. For the British government, one Chinese sailor in particular exemplified their heroic qualities. He's Poon Lim, Chinese merchant seaman. His ship was sunk in the Atlantic, but he managed to swim to a raft, and on this he was adrift for 133 days. For four months, he lived completely alone in the midst of the ocean, on a piece of wood six feet square. He fought all the elements, hunger, thirst, and despair, and won. Just months later, British officials wanted to get rid of thousands of Poon Lim's fellow sailors. But at the key meeting of October 1945, civil servants were told they only had legal grounds to deport 18. So they hatched a plan to change the rules under which the sailors could land in Liverpool, in effect, to trip them up. The landing conditions will be varied so as to require the man to leave by the theoretical sailing date of the ship. At the end of the day, on that date, the ship will leave the dock but will wait in the river for two more days before actually sailing. We shall be grateful if as soon as possible after midnight on the theoretical sailing date, you would telegraph to us the names of the men who have failed to join the ship in accordance with their landing conditions. You will then be able to enforce the orders by placing the men on board the ship before she sails two days after the theoretical sailing date. So they changed the dates when men were required to report to a ship, either forcing them to go on board or, if they fail to, giving officials grounds to make legal orders against them. This is your dad? Yes. My dad was named N.G. Loy, and he was 29, and he was a bachelor. June Caddick has official proof of her parents' marriage, but it was only when she had to produce her birth certificate on the eve of her own wedding in 1963 that she realised her real father may be among the repatriated men. Well, this is, this is the birth certificate, which revisits some of these facts. Yes. But not all of them, because here we have the story of your birth, your mum, but not your dad. But not my dad, no. Why? I don't know what happened to that. It's almost as if he's been... Obliterated whitewashed out of the story. Yes, yes. He's unpersoned, which is extraordinary, isn't it? It is. So they were married, and then he's deported from Liverpool. Like thousands of other Chinese, uh, they all got rounded up and sent back. But they were married. Well, there was, there was no one to uh, fight for them in them days, like there is now. And I don't know what happened after that. All I know is when I was older, I heard uh, it sent a letter to my mother said he was destitute and he wanted money. But I don't know what happened, whether she sent the money or what. So what do you know of him other than that? There's nothing I know about him, nothing at all. If you could meet your dad now, I wonder what you would say to him. Okay. <laughs> upset me. <laughs> He'd probably be very proud of you, wouldn't he? Probably. But why, aside from snobbery and racial prejudice, were the British authorities so determined to get rid of the Chinese sailors? What are you seeing here? We have a lot of um, memories of 
from older people as they were kids playing on bomb sites and that was a big theme that came through the, the memories shared as part of the exhibition playing on bomb sites and of course all that new housing wasn't some of it wasn't built until the late 50s so there were still lots of bomb sites still across the city for many, many years, and this is a big feature of lots of people's childhoods playing on. Liverpool was heavily bombed during the war, and Home Office documents show that the city's authorities wanted the housing the Chinese were living in for British people who had lost their homes and for British servicemen returning from the war. Around 4,000 people very sadly lost their lives, 10,000 homes were completely destroyed, and 70,000 people were left homeless. So the Chinese sailors were kicked out, in part, to help solve a housing crisis after the war. You say that Liverpool lost tens of thousands of houses in the bombing. Was it justified to expel the relatively small number of Chinese sailors who were here to try and solve that problem? Well, it sounds very much like a, a justification, doesn't it, to, to, to get rid of, of, of the Chinese men. Um, obviously, it's, it was a, such a small percentage of all those homeless people requiring homes. I can't imagine it would have made much of a difference. Why did they do it? Why expel these, these men? If, if they were using that as an excuse, it was... Um, a solid one to go with. There's, there's no dispute in that there was this massive acute housing shortage. But of course, in reality, it really wouldn't have made that much difference or impact, would it? It may also have been about freeing up jobs, but that's not an explanation accepted by Keith Cocklin, whose father was forcibly repatriated. Do you have any sympathy with the political landscape in which this decision was taken? Britain was broke after the Second World War, Cities like Liverpool had been bombed, housing was in short supply, the returning army needed jobs. Do you understand why this decision, this policy was made? Do you have any sympathy with it? No, because the Chinese were not taking any jobs uh, in, in the English or the British industry. They worked for the Blue Funnel and the only people that worked for the Blue Funnel were people from China or the deck officers, which were British. So they weren't taking anyone's job whatsoever. They weren't taking anyone's houses because the people who lived in these houses accommodated the Chinese people as uh, people that could live there and pay their rent. So it was of no consequence that that, that, is, that is just a, a way of saying, let's get rid of them. As this recent strike demonstrates, Liverpool dockers and sailors have a long history of industrial militancy. So no, we will not accept a pay cut. Shame on you! Shame on you! And that's a clue to what may have been another major motivation for the British authorities. Despite braving the same conditions, the Chinese sailors were paid far less than their British counterparts and denied a war bonus until they went on strike in 1942. Shipping companies wanted them back on much lower Far Eastern rates of pay, which meant making sure they could only sign on to ships in China and Singapore. So company pressure and government policy had the effect of a pincer movement, forcing the men out one way or another. When they couldn't coerce the men into going, these documents show they took direct and brutal action, sending in Britain's political police force to round them up. In the company of Sergeant Jones of the Liverpool Special Branch, two whole days were spent in intensive search of approximately 150 pool boarding houses, private boarding houses 
and private houses. And this is what that meant for the sailors' families, as one of their wives described to an interviewer in 2010, on condition that she remained anonymous. One day, I remember, um, he came in and he said he was going to sign on a ship. I think my son was about eight months old, and he said, sometimes they could sign on and go straight onto the ship. So he went, he never came back, so I thought, he's got the ship. So I waited for a week or so, and then I went up to the officers to see if there'd been any half pay left for me, because the women used to get what they called half pay then. And Mr Smith, who was the boss of the office, he said to me, what ship is he on? I said, well, he came up to sign on. I said, and he didn't come back. So he said, oh, so he got all the bones. He said, well, what? his name's not on any of the ships. He's never got a ship from here. And he said, the name's not on. So I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I don't know. But uh, apparently, he must have been in one of them. Apparently, the emigration or somebody came and took a lot of the Chinese out of the office, out of the cafes, I put them on a ship and they went, and nobody heard another thing about them. And I presume he was one of them because I never heard or seen a thing from then till now, nothing. Everybody was too busy getting sorted out after the war and they were rebuilding and everybody was trying to get their lives together. What did a few Chinese matter? It's awful to think that they could just do something like that and nobody cared. But they didn't care. Nobody cared. Nobody bothered. Nobody even looked into us. It wasn't even... You know, made nothing was made public. It was just all hushed up. It was all hushed up. I don't... They couldn't do it now and get away with it. But they did it then and got away with it. It was from houses like these on the edge of Chinatown that men were taken, put into vans and driven to the docks. As the thumbprints on these crew lists show, many were unable to write in English. So, prevented from leaving their ships, unable to let their families know where they were, they often simply disappeared. And in an age before computers and widespread use of telephones, these men simply disappeared and couldn't be found. They vanished. No, that was it. That was the, the end of contact. I mean, most of the Chinese seamen probably couldn't write English for a start, so the idea of them writing letters the wives had lost the homes, so they're not even in the addresses that the seamen were present at. And for years, lots of these wives didn't even know that their husband had been deported. He just vanished. So there was quite a lot of bitterness with some of the wives. They felt they'd been abandoned at the worst period in history. Yeah. Yeah. As awareness of what happened to the sailors has grown, Children and grandchildren have been organising to share stories and campaign for an apology. For brothers like Joe and John, it's not just the loss that feels so wrong to them. It's the realisation they and their mothers had been deceived into believing the men had just abandoned them. When, you, when, when, when you've been left, oh, you're, you're always yearning for your father. And... Uh, It's, it was so awkward to not have one. Now, I was led to believe uh, that my father left my mother and she was angry at him. Not, since then, I found out he was shanghai meaning he was deported. At 71, I decided, well, I had no allegiance to this man. Why should I have allegiance to this man when he left four children in the UK? Why should I have an allegiance to him? So I deposed my name from Joseph Phillips C to Joseph Phillips and knocked the Z and D off. Like my brother says, yeah, he, he, he uh, changed his name, and I understand that. But for me, C is everything. 
and uh, I'm very, very proud of my name. You talked of anger. Have you changed your view of your father? As the understanding starts coming out, of course I've changed it, because if he was taken from us, and we don't know the full truth of it, because it's very hard to establish where he's gone. I do ancestry, and when I get passed to my father, it becomes a block. No, no, where he is or what he's gone. So no, I'm not angry at him anymore. What I want now is the truth. I need, it needs to be exposed. The injustice needs to be put right. What do you want? I want to know who my father is. I want to know who my Chinese family is, my, who they are, where they are, because they're a missing part of me. They're a missing part of my family. If you could meet him now, what would you say to him? Well, I'd give him a big hug first. And say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. And we couldn't do anything about it. But we can now. We want the truth. Own up to what they did. And let us step, settle. We're not got that many years left in us. But we just want the truth. So what, is, what, do we, what does this say? This is just my birth certificate. I was born on the 8th of February 1945, Smithdown Road, Judith, a girl, to Chang Yushang. So Chang Yushang is your dad? Yeah, is my dad. Uh, Maureen Duddy. Judy Kinnan's father was one of the thousands deemed undesirable. He was a ship spitter. He couldn't write English, so he had to have that marked by somebody. And the 28th of March, 1945. She was just one when he was repatriated. That's my mum. She's beautiful, isn't she? Dad. Yeah, he's and a me. good, good now, looking Now, on boy. the back of here, when he disappeared, this she'd wrote on the back of it, to my darling, joyful wishes you to keep with happy from Miss Mooring and baby darling, you have now left me, it is 10 months. God, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah. He's a good looking bloke, so he meets this beautiful woman in Liverpool. Yeah. And she said, she said, that were, she said she just thought the world of him. Just thought the world of him, you know. So your dad is seized and put on a ship. And we, yeah. don't, we don't know what happened next. Never know. What effect did it have on your mother? Terrible, because all her friends said just stress and anxiety was all. It took her a couple of years to get herself back to normal. And yeah. she never really knew what she happened. Ne she never knew what happened, so she couldn't tell me. Because that second photograph she sent out with a sailor once, because she thought he'd just left her. And he you didn't, know what just, and he leave didn't her. just leave her at all. And it came back and said, well, we can't find him. She clearly loved him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she did. Everyone says that. Most of the men were coerced into signing on as crew, some as passengers, and some were just shipped as unnamed cargo. Where names are recorded, they can be wrongly transliterated into English. But one of the main obstacles to tracing sailors is that China was in a state of civil war at the time, so the fate of many of the men returned, especially to Shanghai, remains a mystery. This is a picture of my dad, and it's actually the earliest photograph we have of him because when his dad was deported, my dad ended up in an orphanage. So he's this age when he's returned home to his mum. So apart from not being able to identify my granddad, we don't even have a baby picture of my own father. And as you can see in this picture, he's got a borrowed jacket on and probably no trousers and he sat in front of a table, just borrowed clothes to take the shot really. So, and there are no photographs of him as a baby, that, that's Not a it. single that's one, this is, this is where it starts. This is the first picture we have of him at all. And nothing of Grandad? Not a single thing, except his name on a wedding certificate. We haven't got any pictures. We don't have a seaman's pouch. We don't have any family photographs. So, yeah, this is our earliest start of our family memories, really. 
Keith did eventually find out some details about his father, Sung Kwai Sing. I often wondered why my children were so brilliantly clever and where they got it from. And uh, it turns out that uh, my father, although he worked in the engine room, he was an interpreter between the Chinese and the English uh, uh, officers. He was a doctor of medicine. And uh, because of the war and the invasion by Japan, China was a very poor country. So he tracked from Shanghai to India and joined the Blue Funnel Shipping Company. Keith never met his father, but eventually discovered he had family in China he'd never seen until 12 years ago, when he had a visit from a Chinese nephew, the son of a half-brother Keith never knew he had. He was my uh, brother's son. And uh, <laughs> we met, he came to Liverpool. And uh, we went out for the evening. And, uh, and, and he told me about my two sisters and a brother. He was my brother's son who was trained to be a lawyer um, and had come to Manchester to do a special course and then was um, flying back to Japan in a few days' time. So I met him. What did you say then? You know, <laughs> I didn't say too much, but uh, I just asked him how things were and one thing or another. and. Uh, that my brother wanted to come over here. And I said, well, I'll try and see what I can do. But the mystery deepens, he disappeared. Your dad will be proud of all the work that you've done, surely. I would hope so. The law at the time meant British-born women who married foreign men automatically lost their citizenship and so any rights to government support. Although that was changed by the post-war Labour government, many women were left destitute when their husbands were repatriated, sometimes with awful consequences for families. How do you find the last remains of someone who is buried in an unmarked grave? When you access the death certificate, you can also access a burial um, certificate, and that will give you the cemetery and the grave number or the plot number where they're buried. Um, so Havan was buried in the pauper's grave along with another 43 people. Esther Bedo, who was married to seaman Chao Ah Wong, could never afford a gravestone for her son Havan after he died as a baby in 1945. It's only recently Esther's granddaughter Anne has been able to identify the grave and mark it. This is my mum's brother, Esther Bedo, and Chao Ah Wong's son, Havan Bedo. His name is written in English there, Havan, but he's named after his father, which is Ah Wong. Esther's husband was repatriated. Her baby son had died, and she gave up her baby daughter to be adopted by her own parents. I don't think Esther ever recovered from losing Chao Ah Wong and from losing his son. She gave my mum up to her mum, and, her, and she died when she was 30, Esther. And she never knew that he'd been repatriated forcibly. 
and it's a little too late for Esther. She felt that she couldn't keep my mum because she was an unmarried mother and she was mixed race, and so she gave my mum up for adoption. Um, she died very young. She was an anorexic, which is a sign of men bad mental health, very bad mental health, and she died by the time she was 30. So for Esther, that's too late to put that right for her. She died thinking and feeling she'd been abandoned. For my mum, it meant that she grew up without a father. She's never had a photograph of a dad. She's never had a relationship with a dad because she was brought up by a grandma and granddad who were born in 1896 and 1898. They were very traditional English and they kind of closed ranks around her to keep her safe and try and harden her to the racism that she was having to face at the time. What happened to the women and children who were left behind? Overnight, the breadwinner's gone. They can't pay the bills, they can't feed the children. Those that were married have been given alien status for marrying a foreign man anyway. What does that mean? That what? they're not entitled to services, that they're not traditional British citizens anymore. They take on the status of the husbands. So it was overnight destitution is what happened to the people that were left behind, the wives and the children. Some mothers managed to keep it together and they managed to feed the children and get through them years. Other mothers didn't. Lots of the children went into care. My dad went into an orphanage. And I mean, my dad's quite lucky. He was returned to his mum at 11. There's many others went into the care system who had no one to be returned to. So th there's possibly people out there that don't even know they're part of this story. Half Chinese, British people, brought up in an orphanage, and they've got no idea that this is the set of circumstances that led to them being in orphanages in the first place. Britain's Home Office recently reviewed the files from the 1940s and admitted the policy was racially motivated. It said more than 8,000 Chinese merchant seamen had been repatriated, that many of them had been given no choice and hundreds of them may have been married to British women. A minister wrote, I very much regret some of those who served in the Merchant Navy during the Second World War were treated in this way. The deportations were carried out under a Labour government. Some of today's Labour lawmakers want both the current Conservative government and their own party leadership to make a formal apology. When you look around the table, a lot of these people are very emotional and they're getting old. Mm -hmm. You're their last hope, really, aren't you? Well, I think um, a number of people before me tried to um, get some justice for the families of the forcibly departed. And um, I'm going to make it um, my duty as the MP for this constituency to do everything I can while I'm still um, the Labour MP. And if I'm um, re-elected in the next election, I will continue. You know, um, we mentioned at the meeting today that um, this injustice took place under um, a Labour-run government. You know, so to have uh, a level of acknowledgement from our current party you know, would be um, a step in the right direction. Why do I think it happens? Ultimately through racism. And when it comes to East and Southeast Asian racism, the UK has been far behind acknowledging the level of racism that is levelled at Chinese people, East Asians and Southeast Asians. We saw the racism of old that saw these Chinese seamen deported rear its ugly head again over the last two years of the COVID pandemic. And what I want to ensure is that we learn from those past mistakes so that we do not continue to have resurgences of racism against our communities because it hadn't gone away. It wasn't like COVID was something new. It was just like it was racism on steroids against us. Now I have a little girl and I don't want to see is that she is subjected to the same racism in this country that other generations have been as well.
Today's Liverpool Chinese community still has a strong sense of identity. Many of the descendants of deported sailors struggle to know where they fit because they've been denied that family link to their Chinese heritage. I feel like we've been robbed <laughs> slightly of our heritage and it's all to do with self-identity so it matters and when you don't look the same as other people you don't quite fit in there's a negative element there with the racism and we've never had anything positive to readdress it and rebalance it and so that's what i want for my mum she's 76 and she's not getting any younger and i wanted to have that photograph of her dad i wanted to know what happened to him i wanted to know if he did get married and have a family and we hope he did and he had a happy life. It's my grandfather who was deported, but I've grown up in Britain in the 70s and 80s, and there's no getting away from the racism. My entire life, people say to me, where are you from? You're obviously not fully British. And then I'm left with that awkward position of, uh, 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 I actually don't know anything about my culture or my roots or other than a sailor's name. We'll never forget, for those requests to leave this country, they have to go. Because um, we don't need them anymore. The country don't need them anymore. This memorial to the sailors, approved by Liverpool Council in 2006, goes part way to recognising the wrong done, saying the men were required to leave. Many in the Chinese community now want the whole truth to be acknowledged. You need a new plaque, really, that's a bit more honest, don't you? I would think so. I think if the Home Office accept the, the new wordings, we want to pacify, we want to work together, and, and that's what our children, our grandchildren in Liverpool wants. Those are the history. But except these legacy has to be written like deportation, like they were rung up and taken back to China without any legal process. I think that's important. What do you say to the people who might say this was all a very long time ago, you should simply just move on? It might have been a long time ago, so there's been an injustice for a long time, and it's about time that people stood up and put it right. What would they do if it was their father? You'd want to know. I don't care who you are, I feel as if no matter what you'd want to know, if you could, you know, and they've been hiding it all these years. You know what I mean? I mean, say the way my husband passed away so quickly, that could happen to me and I'll never know. And I think that's what we're waiting for. Are they just waiting for you all to die I off? think so, yeah. Then they've got no one to commit to then, have they? Mm. It's hurtful though, hurts. A lot of people will say, look, the landscape in which these events unfolded was the chaos of a world war. They could just apologise, though, couldn't they? You know, to actually make people feel better. They could have just said, we're really sorry what happened. There's nobody alive who made those decisions. But we're still treating people who've worked for Britain like dirt and disregarding their entire lifetime spent in Britain and any family that they've built up. So I don't have any expectations that the government's going to do anything really except make a few noises. Like I say, they've not even apologised. That'd be a start. <laughs>